Hey, and welcome into another episode of the Fat Guy Podcast. My name is Brett. Lost about 125 pounds on a ketogenic diet, and I feel, I feel, uh, what do I feel today? I feel lucky, I guess, is the word for today. Uh, today's topic is the number one thing uh, that ensures successful weight loss. I'll be uh, uh, breaking down really what it boils down to if you want to be successful. Now, I don't mean successful in terms of losing 10 pounds by your wedding day or five pounds by bikini season. Uh, that isn't. You know, that's a challenge for people, but that isn't real weight loss, and it really isn't for people with real problems. <laughs> it's people who are, you know, a few pounds over, and they just want to hit some kind of goal to look extra nice on a special day or something. I'm talking about real weight loss for real people, obese people, really overweight people. So, I've helped hundreds of people lose weight and get healthier. It's my passion in life. Um, if that's something you think is worth supporting, I would uh, ask you to take a moment and check out my Patreon, toss five bucks my way. It really helped me with what I do. I really do spend more time than you would imagine helping people. I like it. I enjoy it, and I've done it for free for a long time. Uh, that's why I, uh, well, we're uh, taking a, a donation model. So if you want to help out, that'd be greatly appreciated. Head on over to KetoAnimal.com, KetoAnimal.com, and chip in. Uh, hey, if you do, I'll give you a shout out on future episodes for as long as you're a supporter and you'll get a bonus free podcast over there that only supporters get to hear. So head on over to KetoAnimal.com. If you can't swing the five bucks, you know, maybe you're in a bad way. I know what that's like. There's other ways you can help that are completely free. Cost you nothing. A five-star rating on Apple Podcasts would be a great place to start. Apple Podcasts is the number one supplier of podcasts, so... Uh, head on over there, give us a five-star rating, and uh, leave a few words about how the show's helped you or whatever. That would be awesome. Number two is follow me on social media and then share it with others. That'd be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. My username is Fat Guy Podcast on all of those. Um, and then, of course, if you're not subscribed, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get podcasts. Uh, that'd be Apple Podcasts or pretty much anywhere else podcasts are available. And uh, if you don't understand how that works, I didn't when I first started in podcasts. Super easy solution for you. Download a free app. It's called the Spreaker app. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Download it for free. Once you download it, search for Fat Guy Podcast. Hit that heart button and subscribe. Not only do you get notified about new shows, you can scroll back and listen to all the other episodes archived in order by title. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. The Spreaker app is free to download and look. There's thousands of other podcasts on there besides mine, so who knows what you'll find on there that you will love. Share this episode on your social media. You never know whose life you'll change just by hitting the share button. That's how I found keto. That's how my life was changed. Quick disclaimer before we get to the nuts and bolts and things. I'm not a doctor. I have no formal medical training. Anything you hear in this podcast is strictly my opinion and my personal experiences only based on my years of research and applying it to my health. Nothing I say is meant to be specific diet or weight loss advice for you. It's simply my opinions and my personal experiences. Before you begin any diet change or weight loss program, you should consult a doctor. So let's uh, go back in time to when I began my, my weight loss journey. Seriously, it was 2013 and... My mom had been diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer. She had made it through uh, just a gruesome, brutal surgery. Um, and uh, I'm a realist kind of guy, and uh, I always hoped that my mom would beat it, but um, I knew that the odds of that were very slim, and that my mom would be needing me at some point because uh, I was I was I was my mom's family that was left, immediate family, obviously other family and, and some of them helped in many ways so I don't mean that in any kind of a slight but it's my job to take care of my mom she would have took care of me I knew that was coming and I could barely walk up and down the halls of UAB with her when all this started I remember when she first got diagnosed first of all she'd been feeling horrible um, they'd went into her for explo- for a, a hysterectomy and found the cancer so while she didn't have the surgery she had been cut open and she recovered from that and then we immediately got into holistic ways of helping slow down or fight the cancer or do whatever we could, and we ran across this fasting regimen. My mom had been fasting for, I think it was 16 or 17 days. And um, 
Then we made it up to UAB. My mom is out walking me up and down the halls. She has way more energy than me. I have to ask her to stop a couple of times. And um, I remember thinking at that time, God, this is just, <laughs> what, what have you become? Your mom, who's 20 years older than you, her insides are re- wrapped up with cancer at, on a catastrophic level. She hasn't had anything to eat for like 17 days post-surgery. And um, here we are. She's walking rings around you. And um, it was it was very humbling. It was very humbling, which my mom's always outdone me. Look, look this, this wasn't by far what the first time my mom or my dad had outdone me. My mom and dad worked like they worked, worked, worked. And uh, when I was a young child, they made me work along with them, which was was to my detriment, really, because I remember being young and swearing once I ever got out of that house that my number one goal in life would be to make enough money that I didn't have to work like that, that I didn't have to have a garden, you know, that I didn't have to raise whatever food, (laughs) Um, you know, that I didn't have to uh, slave out in the yard all day cutting grass with an old beat up lawn push lawnmower. And, uh, I mean, I, it really was my, I know it's horrible goals to have. And then the, my other goals to have was to have good food. Um, which apparently I did a pretty good job eating the food my mom cooked, you know, knowing what I know now, I know why it made me fat. It wasn't that there was a lot of it. It's just what it was. And it had to be f- cheap food. Carbs are cheap food. Sugar is cheap. Carbs are cheap. And so, you know, um, that's a lot of what our meals consisted of. Meat was expensive, and uh, especially in my earlier years, we rarely had meat. And when we did have it, we had very little of it. So anyway, I won't get into that, but <sighs> jumping back ahead to 2013, um, you know, I was too stressed out and things were going too crazy at that time to really get into the weight loss. But after it leveled down and she finally recovered from exploratory surgery from the cancer, which which nearly killed her. I mean, my mom, I've never seen my mom give up on anything or think about giving up, but right there, about halfway through that recovery from that surgery, my mom really considered giving up. Like she was, you know, when you take a woman who's never stopped or never slowed down or never hinted at at, at having to chug very hard at anything and could, it could blast through anything. Like, I'm not saying that she didn't have things that were hard. I'm just saying it didn't matter to her. My mom would just blast through anything. And she finally ran up against something that didn't work like that. And um, I remember it being so weak and so frail. Her body was so frail. And and as a result, her mind was so frail. And I remember she reached a point where she really questioned. And she told me one day that, uh, you know, she uh, dad had come to her in a dream or something and told her it was okay to do whatever you want to do. And I'm like, what does that mean, Mom? She goes, I don't know. I don't know what it means. I just, I just don't think I can keep going. And. Anyway, look, she pulled through it. My mom was, a fu- was just one of the strongest human beings ever to exist. Definitely the strongest human being I've ever known. Uh, but she got through it and got you know got up and around. And then we got to where we were starting to do chemo. And made her first trip up there for chemo. And it was all this walking again. And I was smoking, man. You know, I was a smoker at that time. And, oh, God, I couldn't breathe. And I, I can't tell you how many times I'd ask my mom to stop. And, uh, boy, that was it. And so I began my weight loss journey. Started out with a product, if you're familiar with the pink drink. And surprisingly, that helped me. And it helped me. I don't remember how much I lost, man. It was you know, 30, 40 pounds or something. Uh, but it eventually stopped, like all of them do. I think I think it did work a little. Well, I know it worked a little because I, now I know some of the science behind it. It helped to keep blood sugar low, which is one of the keys to weight loss because that in turn keeps insulin low. But I guess the effect wears off. Then I know they also changed the formula. And then uh, I know a lot of it also is uh, placebo. You know, once you start losing weight, it emboldens you to do more things to lose weight. So I was taking this stuff, but I was also doing a lot of things on my own. I was counting calories. And, you know, I remember at that time telling people how I still ate McDonald's. And I did. I still ate McDonald's, still ate Burger King. But, you know, I'd go and I would cut a quarter of the hamburger out. I always had a knife with me in the vehicle. And I'd take it with me and I'd cut a quarter of the hamburger out and I'd throw half the fries away and I'd get a diet drink. And, um, you know, I just, I was doing things like that because I was motivated and I was losing weight. But anyway, that stuff eventually quit working and I'd figure out, I'd, and I wanted to figure it out. And plus I was researching help for my mom, like from the day my mom was diagnosed with cancer, 
I spent hours and hours on the on the computer researching, uh, looking at research and the the literature and um, you know all these studies and trying to figure out everything I could about health. And I learned a lot of things about it that would apply to me as well as her. Because let's be real, and and you should understand this. And yes, I'm going to get to the point. I promise you. <laughs> I promise you, I'm going to get to the point. So just hang in there with me. But if you don't understand anything else, understand this. If you get healthy, if you get, if you uh, move towards a healthy state, that means eating healthy, acting healthy, you the, you will lose the weight. You don't have to try to lose the weight. Healthy people aren't overweight. Um, and that's a great secret. Um, it, it's it's a compounded secret because then the question becomes, well, what does that mean, be healthy, eat healthy? You know? Does it mean what the federal government, nutritionists, and doctors have told us since the 60s and 70s, which is eat less and move more? It certainly sure as hell is not that. The only thing that's happened since they started giving that advice is people have gotten fatter, and we went from type 2 diabetes being something you rarely seen till now like 40% of the population is on it or on the fast track to it. So, uh, you know, obesity levels have doubled Morbid obesity's tripled. Kids are obese now. I mean, none of this ever happened before, but I digress. So, <clears throat> uh, I, I moved into a, a, you know, to a healthier way of eating and experienced more success and more success. And, uh, then I got to where I was going to a track. And then I got where I was jogging, man. I hadn't jogged since like 10th grade in school because I was just too big. And uh, truth be known, I was still too big to be jogging, but I just felt so good. Um, wound up blowing my knees out one time. It took me forever to get over from that. And then I had another injury, and it was a much worse injury, and it took a long time for it to get well enough that I could get out of the recliner much. And that injury set me back so much because I couldn't move, and I was depressed. <clears throat> and I had gained, or uh, I had lost over 60 pounds, and I gained all of that weight back. I gained every single pound back. As a matter of fact, I gained exactly every single pound back to where I was exactly where I started, 410 pounds. And I had to do a reset, and I did a reset, and I was just doing this and thinking at that and trying to implement some things. And then my mom hit a health crisis to where, you know, this is where the really end stages of her cancer started. And she couldn't eat anything. And I was bound and determined to, to do and anything I could do beyond what medicine could do to keep my mom alive. And that's when I discovered keto. That's when I discovered low concentrated volumes of food that was super high in calories. And that would be fats, saturated fats, uh, healthy oils like olive oil and avocado oil and... um you know, nut butters and um, um, it, things of that nature. And I began to construct a shake for my mom so that she could literally drink just one cup of liquid a day and get 2,000 calories. And even on days she couldn't manage to get that one cup down, if she only got three quarters of it down, she was really at a maintenance level of calories for her size. So, you know, 1,500 calories or whatever. And my mom had been on a weight losing spree for uh, two or three weeks since leaving the hospital. She had a perforated bowel, which she shouldn't really have survived that, but she did. And um, that shake saved my mom's life. And it was a ketogenic shake. It was all keto. It was for my research on keto. And so to make my life easy, I just went keto with her. Uh, everything I bought was high fat, you know, low carb. And man, the weight just was dropping off. The weight was dropping off like you would not believe. And so my mom was getting her strength back and I was losing weight. And it was like the most, it was like, wow, it, it was an epiphany like I'd never realized before. And the thing that really made me realize what epiphany it was is going back to that statement I made earlier. When you get healthy, eat healthy, live healthy, the weight handles itself. And so this diet was doing two things at the same time for two different people, two different problems. I was doing it, feeling great, fully satiated, satisfied, and losing weight. My mom was doing it, was satiating and satisfying her, and she was gaining weight. Now, you think about that. Two people on the same diet, 
having two exact opposite results, but both being the right results. Now, where, where does that happen? And so uh, I was sold, and uh, my mom was a little questionable on the cancer fighting thing because uh, we had originally done a, mostly did a vegan diet, plant based diet for her. And, and just to digress for a second, I believe that that diet was one of the best things for her, and I believe it extended her life mainly because um, the part of it that affects cancer, which is the not, uh, which is the very low, low uh, sugar content of it, because. She did the vegan diet, but it was she had very little in the form of fruit. Um, it was uh, uh, vegetables, and it was green vegetables. Uh, she would occasionally have a potato or something like that, but mostly she just did tons of greens and broccolis and you know things that you eat on a keto diet. But again, I'll digress. It's just, it's really in a podcast about cancer, but I think it's important to that you know where I came from and how I wound up where I was at. And I think it's important to know that I, I feel like I've had three stages to my weight loss journey. I've actually just now entered into a fourth stage, which I'll mention briefly. But in all three stages and entering into this fourth stage, one thing has been true throughout to ensure weight loss success. And it's one thing you can't get away from. Obviously, the, the the number one thing is that you have to have a successful plan, right? You got to have a successful plan. Um, it, it's got to be something that's right. And it's going to be something that works. Because if, if you don't have that aspect up to it, then this other part does, doesn't make a hill of beans. So I'll tell you what that is after I do a quick shout out to my current amazing Patreon supporters. And they have headed on over to KetoAnimal.com, K-E-T-O, KetoAnimal.com. And they signed up at one of the several different support levels. $25 Super Keto Warrior level, Angie Bearfield and Donna Eason. Thank you guys so much. And the $5 Keto Warrior level, Bobby Houston, Lena Kirkland, Roger Foise, Kim Nauman, or Naaman, and Greg James. Thank you guys so much for that. If you want to support what we do, it's super easy. Not only you get a shout out on the podcast, but you'll also get... A uh, podcast just for supporters that nobody else gets over at Patreon. Five bucks is uh, the, to help me out. So head on over there to ketoanimal.com. So the number one thing to do is, to, is it is it, it, and it's not a secret, but it seems like it is a secret. Especially because we live in this world of, man, how fast can I do this? Or what kind of results can I get by X date? And weight laws don't work like that. Like, when you become, especially when you reach the obese level or the morbidly obese level, you have suffered so much internal metabolic damage that you are going to have a conscious effort to continue losing to hit your goal weight and to continue to be conscious about it for decades because you have been metabolically ruined inside from the sugar and carbs and stuff from the standard American diet. Now that stuff, they, there's studies out there showing that that stuff does start to, to reverse. Your insulin sensitivity does start to get better. But man, they, there's not nearly enough research to know how many years or decades it'll take for it to ever get back to its optimum level, if it ever will. It, we do see that it will improve. But you got metabolic damage, and metabolic damage means weight gain so easily. So it's always going to be something you're going to have to do. Like, you're never going to stop. Don't don't ask me how long do I have to do keto. You got it. If keto is your choice and that's what's going to work for you, you're always going to have to do it. That's just that's just the rest of your life. Look, you can allow yourself more cheat days and stuff. You know, if you ever get to your goal weight, you know, then you can cheat more. If that's what you want to do, um, you know, but take it from me and anybody else I've ever worked with. Cheating makes it really hard to stay keto. So you want to keep your cheats to a minimum and keep them as healthy as possible. But they happen. But the number one thing to do is to, is to understand that you're going to do it always and understand that consistency is the thing that gets you there. It's not that I'm going all out this week or I can go all out for two weeks or I can really kill this for a month. I mean, that's a great attitude to have and you will kill it for a month if you have that attitude. But at some point, you're going to fall off and things are going to go off the rails. The more important attitude to have is I'm never giving up. I'm never quitting. And so that's the testimony I want to give today about my journey that started back in 2013. It's been up, it's been down. Um, 
I had the issues with the injury, which, which wrecked it. I had the issue with, uh, you know, I told you about that trip to the hospital with my mom where she had the perforated bowel. I thought she was going to die. You know, we were in the hospital two weeks that week and I had been eating a plant-based diet and there was no way to eat a healthy plant-based diet in that hospital. It was impossible, which is sad. You could get a salad in there. That was about it. And it wasn't a salad full of calories and it was very small and very expensive. I tried it for a few days and, and, and she couldn't do it. And so I just went to eat the crap that they brought to the room. I gained like 25 pounds in there in two weeks. 25 pounds I gained eating only the food that they brought to me on the guest tray. I ate the same food they were bringing my mom and I gained 25 pounds. That's how bad food in a hospital is. Look, hospitals are great places to go if they got to sew you up or mend a leg or cut just cut something out or, you know, things like that. But for, for health and nutrition, hospitals ain't crap. They don't know nothing. I could go on. I could do a whole podcast about that, but I won't. It's consistency and it's determination that it is the, it's the mindset and the determination that this is the rest of my life. If you'll accept that right now, you'll be fine. People don't want to accept it, though. They don't want to accept that I'm going to have to be in a, you know, modified form of eating the rest of my life, a way that all the people I know, different from from the way all the people I know eat, different from the way that my brain tells me to eat. Look, if you could ever go, go to eat in the way your brain wants you to eat, um, well, think about it. What got you where you are now? <laughs> it's eating the way you want to eat. So it got, I mean, obviously, you can never go back to that. That's the very definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. You, you, if, if you eat the way you've always eaten, you're going to get the same result you've always gotten. So, you know, you have a past life. And you have to understand that's the past life. And I don't wish to do that anymore. Now, I sure hope this don't come across as preachy. Because I'm going to tell you, I struggle all the time. I just came back from a week-long stay over at the casinos. I pigged out like you wouldn't believe. I ate stuff I should have never eaten. It was bad. And then the after effect is it always takes me like a week to get back on track because you got all those carbs in you and all that addiction comes back. And so you get, look, it's horrible. I'm not perfect by any means. But um, this comes back to what I've said. It's the mindset that you're never quitting. It's the mindset that you're never giving up. It's the mindset that you're always going to be plodding forward no matter what befalls you, whether it's the injury I had, whether it was the deep, dark depression right after my mom died that caused me to go on a binge for like a month, whether it's the uh, uh, super depression thing that just happened on the one year anniversary of my mom passing, whether it's this other injury I had about uh, seven, uh, six, seven months ago that set me back a little bit. Look, all these things keep coming up and they knock me back and they chip me down. Um, the difference between people who continue to move forward and be successful is, and those that don't is like when those things happen, you don't just quit. Like the process it and over and you, it can't be over for you mentally. Mentally, you have to know that, look, that's just part of the process. If you'll accept setbacks as part of the process, and that doesn't mean you give in to them on purpose and go, oh, I'm supposed to screw up. No, 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 no. When it's unavoidable and you can't control it, you get blindsided or something overwhelms you or something uh, that you absolutely can't beat at that moment, that is just one battle out of a lifelong war. The war goes on until you die. The day you die will be the day your war ends. And whether you win the war or lose the war will depend on how you uh, react battle to battle to battle to battle. And we can win battles for three months and lose one for three weeks and have and it can set us back. We can see the scale go up. We can see the bloating come back, the water weight, the feeling bad. And we could give up because of that one lost battle or we could understand that we've been winning the battle for three months straight. And we're going to jump right back in and we're going to get us another three months of victories. Or another six months of victories. Or another nine months of victories. Or we may go another year of victories. Who knows how long we can go. But we got to get in there and stay with it. We got to get in there and stay consistent. The longer you do it, the more natural it becomes to you. The more it just becomes your way of life. And I had somebody ask me this, probably been a month ago now, but I had somebody ask me this. They're like, how long does it take before this just... You know, this is just easy. And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't got there yet. But I know this. Let's just say you're 40, for example. You've been eating horrible for 40 years. 
I don't think it would be unreasonable to expect that it would take an equal amount of years to completely undo the brain that it took you 40 years to create. It took you 40 years of learning foods that you liked, learning all those foods, how to cook them, how to enjoy them, a taste for them, um, a habit of buying them, a habit of you know eating this on this day, and you you know you got your Tuesday meal, you know Saturdays is peak, you know all these habits and tastes and things that you developed the first 40 years of your life or however old you are, if it's 30 years, that was a process that happened. You weren't born loving those things. When you were one year old, it wasn't Saturday pizza day and Tuesday taco night. And, you know, those things had to be learned. Those behaviors and tastes and things had to be learned. And they were learned over years after years after years after years. And it just developed into a routine. It developed into what your brain perceives as normal. And so how long do you think it'll take to reverse something like that completely? I would say it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect that it would take you the same amount of years to undo it as it did to do it. Now, do I really believe that? No, I think it's a lot less. But I think if you go into that with my mindset, you'll be a lot more successful because you're going to understand you got to go the long distance. I haven't got there yet, but me personally, I think, you know, me starting it, you know, in the 40s, I think if I can make it a decade, I, I think I'll have it. You know, I think if I could, I think if I could make it keto for five years, I'll have it really a good solid five years of keto. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. I know the longer you do it and stick with it, the easier so many more things to uh, become like, um, like, look, the one place I still lose it is the casino because you go into that buffet <laughs> and there's every cake on the man, every pie on the man, the cheesecake, the pastries, the gravies, the potatoes, the fried chickens, the fried fish, the hut, you know, everything that you ever thought was good in life is right there. So it's hard. That one's hard for me. But I'll tell you, things like the poker room have gotten easier for me. When I first started going to the poker room, go to play the poker, it was chicken fingers and fries, and I'd feel horrible about it. And, um, you know, the more times I went, the more times I settled into, I've got to figure this out because I can't fall off the wagon every time I come here. And then I, you know, and then I had to train them. I had to train the people at the poker room how to make a, bring me a burger. I just want a plain burger. That's it. I just want a piece of meat or two pieces of meat. I don't know bread on it. You can put one piece of cheese on it because they use that fake processed cheese. They don't use real cheese. So I will get one piece of cheese on there because it's, you know, it's what, it's like three carbs or something. But you can get by with that. And just bring me some mayo. And, you know, the first time I'm like, I don't know how to charge for that. And that's weird. But, you know, you ask them, they figured it out. And now all this, I think almost all the servers down there at the poker room know how to ring that up for me now. Well, so, hey, can I get a uh, two pieces, uh, two two hamburger patties? You know, I don't want no bun or nothing. There's two hamburger patties, one of them with a piece of cheese on it, and some mayo on the side. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and uh, then they have a they have a special that's pretty reasonably keto. You know, it's steak and and uh, steamed vegetables. Uh, they try to bring a potato out there. He's telling me, don't want the potato. I don't want that potato. Don't bring it. Could I substitute it for some more vegetables, please? All that, I, I hope that my point is getting through is it's consistency is what's going to win the day for you. Consistency. It's going to win the day. It's going to win the week. It's going to win your life. It's a unwillingness to concede. It's an, uh, um, I, I refuse to uh, concede. I refuse. Though I mess up, though I gain 20 pounds back, though I gain 30 pounds back, whatever i refuse to concede it's still a journey i know the tools to win i apply myself and jump right back in there so just because i told you i'd mention it i don't think it matters as far as this podcast is concerned but i mentioned the four stages of my dieting adventure so i will i will lay them out for you now i've already covered some of them stage one was the pink drink when i didn't know anything about eating right or nothing i did i just wanted to easy way out and bought this crap that you mix up um, which, which you definitely should not buy, by the way. Um, then I moved into a uh, plant-based diet. Um, 
if it was vegan mostly, but then I'd have spells where it would be like, you know, 99% plant-based and I'd get some meat or something in there every now and then. <clears throat> then I moved from that to keto, discovered keto. And then after I'd been keto for a while, I discovered the power of fasting, whether it be daily intermittent fasting or even uh, more extended fasting. And so that's my stage four. And um, so that's something as simple as you don't eat for 16 hours and then you eat all your food within an eight hour window. And when I say eat, that means anything with a calorie in it. And a lot of people don't understand that. But it's like, no, you don't drink Cokes outside your eating window. <laughs> You know, you don't have a snack. No, if you're going to consume a calorie of any kind, shape, form, or fashion, it happens within that eight hours. And then once that eight hours is over, you're back into a 16 hour of nothing but water and really hard times. You may throw in a Coke Zero or something and feel like you can't make it, but ideally it should be water. And then you can up that to a 20 and four. So for 20 hours a day, you don't eat anything. And then you, you do like two meals in a four hour window. So, you know, like um, two o'clock in the afternoon, you have a meal and then it's six or at three and at seven or something like that. And you have two nice meals and that's it. The whole rest of the day, you're not consuming anything. Boy, it allows that insulin to get low, allows that blood sugar to get really low and that you hit that fat burning mode. Um, and then you can advance it up to the one meal a day, which is one of my favorite ways to eat. You don't eat nothing all day till dinner time. So six, six thirty, seven at night, bam, you have you a big meal. For me, it'd be like 12, 1500 calories or whatever. That's a big meal, but it's a calorie deficit for me. And the the thing I like about one meal a day is that when you eat it, you are stuffed, man. You feel like you've rewarded yourself. You don't feel like you've deprived yourself. And the fasting part is eating is easy if you if that meal you eat is keto, because <clears throat> you don't have the high blood sugar response, which means you don't have the blood sugar crash, which means you don't have the hangry cravings that come. And so it's fine, and you just move through the next day and you eat again. And then from that, uh, obviously, you can do extended fasting where you go, uh, you know, two days or three days or whatever. And I'd mix and match all of those things. And there is, it's powerful tools and it's they really help a lot. So uh, that's not really what this podcast is about, but it came out earlier and so I wanted to detail it. So it's, it's the fourth phase. And look, you have all these tools at your disposal. And that's what I tell people. You know, I have the keto at my disposal. I have the... You know, the, the intermittent fasting at my disposal. I have the extended fasting at my... They're all tools that I can use at different times in different ways. And, uh, you know, I have to be really strong to do the three to five day fast. And so that doesn't happen all the time. But when I get to that point where I am that strong and I am that focused, then I do it. It's a tool. Let me take advantage of it. <clears throat> the sixteen eight intermittent fasting is really easy to do. So I do that almost every day. Uh, except when I'm at the casino. <laughs> But, you know, I have different tools and I, and I love having different tools I can use to help me. And uh, the most important thing by far to take away from this, though, is that it's the long haul. And the sooner you accept it's the long haul and you get the mindset of it's the long haul and that it's a long, long series of battles and you are going to lose a battle coming up. It may be three weeks from now or six weeks from now or three months from now or six months from now, but you're going to lose some kind of battle. But that battle doesn't 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 cause you to 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 uh, concede the war. Understand that you've won literally hundreds of battles before that day, and you will get back, and you will continue to win battles, and you will eventually win the war. But you have to have the mindset we're always going to do it. Hey, if you think this podcast could help friends and family or whatever, please share it on your social media. You could literally change somebody's life. You can also help me by rating the podcast on Apple Podcast. Help me share the word. A five-star rating will let Apple know that this podcast is popular. It'll show up in their directory more and people will be able to find it. Hit the five-star and then leave a little comment about, oh, I've helped you in some way or I've helped others you know or what you like about the podcast. That, that would mean the world to me. And subscribe to the Fat Cod Podcast uh, wherever you get podcasts, uh, whether that be Apple Podcasts or somewhere else. All you got to do is search for Fat Guy Podcast to subscribe. And if you don't understand any of that, Super easy. Download the Spreaker app and search for Fat Guy Podcast and hit the heart button. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Spreaker. Uh, one thing I rarely mention, though, is we do have a website. It's thefatguypodcast.com. And it just, every time I upload a podcast, it just updates. And you can just go to your browser and listen. So, I mean, I guess that would work if you're at work or you're on your laptop or something. It's another way you can listen. Uh, I don't talk about it a lot, but it's a super easy way to listen and if you want to support what we do 
become a Patreon supporter, go to ketoanimal.com. Thank you so much for listening today. I appreciate it.